The ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Uh, I'm very glad we're meeting here at, at this conference, Translation and Interpreting uh, and Culture, entitled Rehumanizing Translation Studies. I'm very glad to have at least some of us, some of you, uh, in person here, and I will introduce each of our speakers today um, uh, separately. But uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, when we announced the title of this conference, Rehumanizing Translation Studies during our last TIC event in Nitra back in 2018, we had no idea uh, how pressing this issue would become in the years to follow. We had to learn to live with technology and even its greatest adversaries have had to learn to cope with it. Uh, the pandemic has radically changed the way we perceive translation, completely redefined the interpreting market and impacted society in general. Yet, at the same time, the human factor uh, has also become more important and acute than ever. Empathy, sympathy, and value of human life and humanism as such have been challenged all around the world. Societies are extremely polarized in many respects, and the gap between us and them seems to be getting uh, wider. And for this precise reason, translation matters. Does it have the potential to bring people who appear not to speak the same language together? Well, I dare not make firm predictions, but one thing I'm quite sure of is that translation has the potential to form part of our collective memory, cataloging with little mercy the rights and wrongs of history and showing us what the future may hold if we do not learn from our mistakes. To formulate the question in a slightly different way, does translation really help us to get closer to them, or is it actually pushing us even further apart? Are translation and interpreting helping to deconstruct the enlightened world and facilitating a plunge into a post-factual era? Are we not indeed, as Andrew Chesterman would put it, just a survival machine for memes? Let us not forget, friends, however, that translation is conducted by the people and for the people, and for this precise reason, the human factor has to matter. I hope that our conference will provide some answers, but certainly it will bring more relevant questions on the f future of the human factor in translation and interpreting. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to our distinguished keynote speakers for accepting our invitation. They are people who need no special introduction. It's Jan Pedersen, who is here with us. Uh, then it's Susan Basnet, who will be joining us remotely. Also, Lawrence Venuti, who will be joining us uh, remotely, and Nadia Garbic as well. Thank you for joining us, and uh, whether virtually or physically, we appreciate that a lot. Uh, my thanks also goes to all of you who will present your papers and introduce us to your research, but also to those of you who've come to support us and ask relevant questions during our discussions. Uh, by the way, you can ask us um, whatever you want through Slido. Uh, you might know the application and hash, uh, the um, password it would be hashtag TIC2021. Um, this conference has been jointly organized by the Faculty of Arts of Maciej Bell University in Banska Bystrica, uh, the Department of Translation Studies, Faculty of Arts of Constantine the Philosophy University in Nitra, also Faculty of Arts of Comenius University in Bratislava, uh, the Institute of World Literature of the Slovak Academy of Science, and the Institute of uh, Slovak Literature of the Slovak Academy of Science. Together, we have decided to join forces and organize a series of events that actually may matter. Uh, of course, this conference would not be possible without the support of the uh, DGT of the European Commission, uh, the US Embassy in Slovakia, the State Scientific Library in Banska Bystrica, and our distinguished sponsors who, deeply involved uh, in the commercial sector of translation sphere, have decided that research and academia actually matter. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to Translation, Interpreting and Culture 2, Rehumanizing Translation Studies Conference. I wish you all a lovely conference experience and fruitful discussions. And now I would like to give floor to the Dean of the Faculty of, uh, Mate, uh, of, uh, Faculty of Arts of Maciej Bell University, Associate Professor Martin Schmidt, who would like to welcome you and tell you a couple of words. Martin, please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you. I see that you can see me. Okay, you hear me, but with echo. Is it okay? May I proceed? Martin? Yes, everything is fine. We can hear you and see you. Everything okay. is perfect. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, it's my great pleasure to open Translation, Interpreting and Culture Conference 21. Unfortunately, I cannot do so in person only online, because our semester has just started and COVID issues consume over my time. Sorry for that. Linguistics seems uh, to be one of the central research areas here uh, at Mate Bell at the uh, Faculty of Arts. We were organizing two international conferences last week. One of them was arranged by the philosophy department and many presentations focused on uh, theoretical and logical aspects of both natural and artificial languages. The other conference, hosted by the Department of Slovak Language and Communication, addressed semi-theoretical issues of everyday communication in several European languages. And today's conference deals with translation and interpreting from the perspective of mainly applied research. I like the range of the linguistic research at our institution that spans from highly theoretical topics to purely applied. I wish you inspiring presentations and of course, heated discussions as well. Finally, I would like to thank our colleagues and everyone who contributed to the organization of this interesting, really big, and I hope great academic and social event as well. So, good luck, Martin. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you very much for your nice and inspiring words. Uh, thank you for your introduction and welcome. And uh, now Ms. Blanka Snobkova was supposed to um, um, tell us a few words about, uh, about this uh, library because she's the director. Unfortunately, she's not able to join us. So uh, now I would like to give floor to Emilia, which is my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, representative of the DGT of the European Commission in Slovakia. I would like to ask her to greet you on behalf of the European Commission. So Emilia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much for having me here today, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, I'm really very happy that I can be here in person today. Uh, I'll touch upon history briefly. When I first met Emilia and Martin, it was back in 2017, and it was our first encounter, and they immediately started talking about this conference that they would like to organize every two years, and each of them taking turns, basically. Um, and I was really happy that we succeeded with the first one, which saw light in Nitra in 2018. Uh, it was the first translation, interpreting and culture conference. And I was even more thrilled when our project for TIC2 and the Translating uh, Europe workshop, uh, which is today, uh, got approved in January 2020. Unfortunately, as we all know, afterwards, soon COVID happened and everything changed, but technology became a larger part of our life, as Martin rightly mentioned. Maybe sometimes the technology is so present that we are really longing for the human factor to be back. Uh, teachers want desperately to see their students behind their desks and uh, friends simply want to hug each other without any restrictions. Um, so. We want technology to be helpful, not to overrule everything. And where is the human factor in that? That will be the topic of our today's uh, conference. Um, collaboration in times of automation is a topic of Translating Europe Forum, which is an international conference organized by the Directorate um, General for Translation. And that will take place in November more precisely from 3rd to 5th November, and you can register to this forum as we speak. 
Uh, this forum is complemented by the workshops like this one we are holding today and the title is Human Factor in Translation Technologies. So I will not speak more and I will let the speakers uh, really tell you more about these. And I will pass the uh, floor back to Martin who is the mega mind behind this conference and deserves this spotlight. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Emilia, uh, for your kind words. And now, without further ado, I would like to invite another Emilia, Emilia Perez, uh, head of the Department of Translation Studies in NITRA and co-organizer of this event. Uh, moreover, uh, my great friend and I would say one of the key figures in Slovak translation studies nowadays. So I would like to um, ask her to join us and introduce the keynote lecture by our dear guest, Jan Perez. And Emilia and Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much. And uh, also from me, good morning to everyone, to all of the colleagues who are here with us in Banska Bistrica, but uh, also for everyone who is following us online. I'm very happy to be here uh, in this beautiful premises. Uh, you can maybe see bits behind us, but uh, I am even more honored that uh, today I can introduce our first keynote speaker. Uh, and it is a person whose name uh, everyone who is involved in audiovisual translation definitely knows. And especially it is a person whose work has been inspiring us uh, in, in many, many aspects. Uh, and I'm very happy that uh, I can introduce Jan Pedersen from Stockholm, Uni from Stockholm University who is here with us today. Uh, just to say a few words about uh, Jan. Uh, Jan uh, is uh, a co-founder of Journal of Audiovisual Translation. Uh, he is also a co-editor of Benjamin's uh, Translational Library uh, and former president of uh, European Association for Studies in Screen Translation. Uh, he used to work as a subtitler for television and also he is the author of very well-known uh, monograph, Subtitling Norms for, for Television. Uh, presently, he is the director of Institute for Interpreting and Translation at the University of Stockholm, where he also researches and teaches audiovisual translation. Uh, today, Jan will talk about subtitling, and he will tell us why humans uh, make better subtitles than, than machines. So I'm very excited. Thank you for coming, Jan, and, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Emilia, uh, and thank you to Emilia and Martin and the rest of you for inviting me here. It's, it's very exciting for me to be here. I've never been to Slovakia before, and this is very exciting. And because of the pandemic, I've not been anywhere for the last two years, so just getting abroad is really quite exciting for me. Uh, I went in an aeroplane, which is <laughs> not very common these days. Uh, anyway, I am going to talk to you now for about an hour or so about rehumanizing subtitling. And I will try to convince you that humans make better subtitles than machines, and then suggest a few other things. Now, uh, I'm going to start to talk about giving you a bit of background about subtitling and about the nature of subtitling. I know Slovakia is a dubbing country, so you may not know as much about subtitling as people in subtitling countries like Scandinavia or... Greece or Portugal may do. Uh, anyway, so establishing some common ground there. And I will then talk about subtitles as products and the process of subtitling. And I will then go on talking about the text concept in audiovisual translation because text means something slightly different when it's full of pictures and sounds than it does if it's just text on page. And then I'll talk a bit about the development of the trade, talking about master template files, particularly English such, and machine translation. And then finally I'll present a study that we've carried out, a colleague and, and myself, investigating the nature and the quality of machine translated subtitles, and so then give a few suggestions for the future. Now, I do realize that this sounds awfully boring, so because of that, I've added some sex and drugs and violence and politicians and airplanes and snakes, just to make it a little bit more interesting for the people out there. So, having said that, I'm going to take off by talking about the nature of the subtitles. And these are some basics, and if you're a subtitle, you already know about this, but these things need to be pointed out. Uh, subtitling is different from other kinds of translation because it has some special conditions and these are the time and space constraints, there's a semiotic shift from speech to writing, and transients, that they are fleeting, now you see them, now you don't, is very important. And then I'm going to talk about something I call polysemiotics or multimod multimodality. Now, um, 
Talking about the time and space constraints, I mean, this has been talked about a lot in subtitling. You only have two lines, you can only have so many characters in them, and also you need to leave them on, on screen for long enough so that people can read them. And this means that not everything that is said is then turned into the subtitle. So the dialogue needs to be trimmed or reduced, uh, but those are very negative words, and I don't think that we should use them. Instead, I use the word condensation, which means that you have to reformulate and rephrase what is said when you translate into subtitles, so to make it shorter. And that means that you have to interpret what the characters are saying, and you also need to interpret uh, what, what is going on on screen, so that you have an interpretation that is shorter and fits the format of the subtitles. And this is what I call creative condensation. You need to work with the language to make it fit the, uh, um, the outer boundaries of the subtitle. Uh, and that is uh, quite a daunting task, actually. Anyone who's done subtitling know the frustration of not... Uh, when you have a perfect translation, it doesn't fit the subtitles, and you have to rework it again to make sure that everything is in there. Now... Um, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of semiotic jaywalking, as Gottlieb calls it. Now, subtitles are, spe uh, are special because they move diagonally, uh, metaphorically speaking anyway, because they don't really move at all, they're just there and then you, they disappear. Anyway, normal or literary translation, for instance, goes from written source language to written target language, and interpretation, as we have interpreters here doing right now, go from spoken uh, source language to spoken translation. Right now I can see Daniel's, uh, Daniel interpreting from my English to his Slovak, uh, but it's still just spoken words. Subtitles, on the other hand, go from mainly spoken language to written subtitles, which means that is a change of mode. And this matters a lot, because there are th things that you say that you don't write. And I'm not talking about taboo words and that, I'm talking about false starts and repetitions and hesitations and so on. That needs to be edited out so that the subtitles make sense, particularly within the time and space constraints. And now I'm going to show, try and show you a clip on YouTube, just to illustrate trans, uh, tra, uh, train, uh, the transience, transient nature of um, of subtitles, and I'm going to use uh, uh, train spotting to do that, hence these, this very weird word, transient spotting. Good luck with interpreting that. Uh, so I'm going to try and leave my presentation for just a second and go to YouTube to show... I actually had a clip of this, but it doesn't work anymore, so that's why I'm doing this, which is a bit nasty for the technicians, but there we go. Choose life. Choose a job. Choose a career, choose a family, choose a fucking big television, choose washing machines, cars, compact displays and electrical tin openers. Now, I could show you the whole movie because it's very good, but I won't. Uh, actually, that would be a very easy way of, of, of earning my keep here today, but I won't do that. Um, what I wanted to show you is subtitles, basically, because normally in academic circles you talk a lot about subtitles, but you don't really see them, so I just wanted to illustrate the transient nature of subtitles. We had uh, this character, Renton, saying a lot of things about choose life, choose your job, choose a career, and so on. And you hear the words when he sp speaks them, but then they're gone. They don't linger like text on page. They just remain in your head. And the same is true for the subtitles. You see them, and then you don't. They go away. They're there for a short time, and then they're just a memory of them in your head. And of course, if you've got a, a DVD or if you're working on streaming, you can go back and reread the subtitles, but people tend not to do that. So subtitles are there, and then they are gone. So subtitles need to make sense immediately, and they need to be uh, accessible and don't cause problems for the, for the viewers. Uh, and when researchers such as myself investigate subtitles, we tend to spend hours and hours looking over uh, every single word and why did they choose this word and why didn't you, they use this construction. But the average viewer doesn't have the time for that. It, they get like three to five seconds and then it's gone. So it's, it's a very transient medium and that, that is very important for anything you, you really do. Now, I want to move on to talk about the text concept in audiovisual translation, and particularly in subtitling. Now, traditionally, uh, a text is written words. Ri they're written monosemiotic constructs, which means that they are texts on page, or on a web page, if you will. 
So you have written text that you see, and which is there, and can be there for millennia. I'm mean, talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls and things. So the text is something static. Whereas in audiovisual translation, you have audiovisual or multimodal text, which are polysemiotic, multimodal constructs, which means that they are constructed not only from written text, they certainly are that, that's because there is written text as well, but main, mainly there is, is the spoken word, which is the, uh, uh, what we call the, the verbal audio channel. And then there is the, no, uh, so there are two, okay, I'll go back. There are two modes and two uh, verbality channels here. So that you have the verbal audio channel and the non-verbal audio channel, and you have the uh, visual verbal channel and the non-verbal visual channel. So there are many things working together, the image, the sound, and text. So all this makes one whole uh, source text, if you will. Uh, which then becomes the subtext, su uh, target text by adding subtitles. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about polysemiotics because it matters. And uh, I know this is a fancy word, and semiotics, as you know, are meaning-bearing uh, constructs, and poly is what you name your parrot. Uh, but apart from that, polysemiotics means basically multimodality. Meaning is constructed through many channels of discourse or many channels of information. So in polysemiotics, you have semiotic channels that normally work like this. They work together, they complete each other and strengthen the narrative. They co cooperate and they tell the same story. Now, sometimes that's how we normally see them and that's how we're used to, used to this. And you have, uh, you have redundancy, the same message is, uh, is, submit, uh, is transmitted through many channels. But occasionally, uh, they, confl uh, they conflict and contradict each other, and then you ca get what I call semiotic tension instead, when they don't work together. And that's not normally the case, but occasionally it is, particularly if, uh, if you involve Quentin Tarantino. So I'm going to show you uh, an awful clip here where you have semiotic tension. This is from the movie Reservoir Dogs. I'm sure some of you have seen it. It's a very famous movie. Uh, anyway, in this scene, this uh, guy that we see here, uh, played by Michael Masson, has kidnapped a police officer, beaten him up severely, and is now about to torture him in a very grim torture scene. So if you're not into violence and torture, I, uh, I suggest that you look away for a bit. In fact, the, the camera even looks away a bit. Oh, oh, not supposed to go there yet, sorry. Supposed to start this. Well, I don't know why I came here tonight. I got the feeling there's something right. I'm too scared oh. because I fall off my chair. And I'm wondering how I get downstairs. Crying on the silhouette of me. Two girls to the right. Here I am, stuck in the middle with you. Yes, I'm Ooh. stuck in the middle. I'm not even in the camera, I can watch this. Oh, oh, well, uh, I'll leave it there, I think. It's, it's just very, very unpleasant, I'm, I'm sure you agree. So the, the visuals are very, very unpleasant. But the song is very nice, isn't it? It's stuck in the middle with you by Steeler's Wheel. It's, it's, it's a brilliant song, right? But you ha here you have a very good example, I think, of violence uh, and also of semiotic tension because what you hear is nice, what you see is gruesome. So the, uh, the semiotic channels don't work together here. They conflict and contradict each other. And sometimes you do that if you're Tarantino and you really want to shock people and make people uncomfortable. So this, this makes you uncomfortable, right? You hear something nice, you see something awful. But a similar thing can happen, happen with subtitles, not, not this grossly, of, of course, but if you have something in the subtitles that contradicts what you see, then you also create sem semiotic tension. If you say, look at this elephant over there, and what you see in the picture is in fact a horse, then the subtitles don't match what you see in, in the image, and then you have semiotic tension as well. Uh, which brings me rather nicely to the concepts of source and target in subtitling. Now, the source text uh, is not a novel, and it's not a newspaper article. It is the whole polysemiotic package 
are the source text. It's the images, it's the sounds, it's everything that you see and hear. Now, the target text, some people consider the target text to be the subtitles, but that is not the case. Subtitles are part of the target text because the target text is the source text and the, the subtitles because subtitles don't make sense of their own. You need the source text to make the target text. So the source text plus the subtitles make the target text. That's the translation, the whole translation. So the source text is part of the target text. And that is because subtitles are additive. They're added. They're added to the source text, in fact, to create the target text. So the subtitles don't replace the, the, the source text as they would in, if you're translating a novel. Instead, they create the target text by, adding, uh, by being added to the, to the uh, source text. So there we have a rather complex issue then of what the source text and the target text is. But it gets worse because there's something called EMTs or master template files in the process. And I'll come back to these. But these are basically time-coded files that are used for making subtitles. And these are also, can also be seen as an alternative source text. And I'll show how they work later on. But, it, but, but they complicate the issue. And when you add the machine translation to it, then the situation becomes even more complex because then you have a more complex source text because then you have the output of the machine as well that works as an alternative source text. So the source text concept becomes very blurred uh, when you add these uh, ingredients. And I'll come back to this. Um, and just to illustrate uh, what I mean by adding the uh, subtitles to make the target text, it's similar to, I'll use a simile, I'll, 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 I'll use some bread. Uh, so if you have some bread and then you put some uh, egg and cheese and spam on it, then you have a sandwich. So by adding something new, you make something new. The source text is still there, the bread is still there, but now by adding the fillers, you have created a target text you have created a sandwich, right? So the source text is the bread, and the whole sandwich is then the target text. The source text is part of the target text. I don't know whether that made it any clearer, but I do like sandwiches, All right? So if we look at subtitles as products then, it's quite clear that they're dependent. Just reading a subtitle file give, does not give you the full picture of, of the movie that you want to see. It, actually, they make very little sense of their own. And they are instrumental because they are not texts of their own, in their own right. They are dependent on the source text. Without the source text, they don't make, make sense. And you can, you can test this by just having people, uh, and they make little sense of their own. Yes. Because people saying, let's go and watch some subtitles. Let's go to the movies and watch some subtitles. Or turn on the telly, I want to read. I mean, no one ever says that, right? So well, you may want to read a translated novel, but you don't want to go to the movie to the, read the subtitles. The subtitles are there to, and, and they're instrumental for you to access the film, to access the TV program. You need them, but you're not, they are not the reason you're there. They're not they don't have intrinsic value. They're instrumental for you to access the movie. And when viewers read subtitles, they do so automatically. Perhaps not in Slovakia, because uh, Slovakian people, Slovak people wouldn't be very used to subtitles. But if you come from a subtitling country, then you read them and you don't notice that you read them. And that's why you, you get uh, um, mottos like the best subtitles are the ones that you never notice that you read. So subtitles just go on and on and on and they're there and you read them. And if you're a Swede or a Portuguese person or something, not reading subtitles is hard. If the subtitles are there, it's really hard not to read them if you're used to them. So they're there and they're just part of the whole thing and you, they help you get immersed in, in the film. But if you get uh, semiotic ten tension caused by erroneous or faulty subtitles, if there is a subtitle error or if there's something like uh, saying the subtitle says elephant when it's in fact a horse, then they break this illusion that you're not reading subtitles and you become aware of the subtitles and you, then you start actually reading the subtitles to see what, was, what went on, on there. There was something wrong there. And then you have an error and people focus on the subtitles and then they don't watch the movie anymore. So it's important to keep your subtitles uh, uh, flowing and, uh, and being, being there for the viewer without seeming to be so. They're just there for you. Now, 
um, I'm going to talk about the nature of subtitling, and then you'll say, well, hold on, you just did that. No, I was talking about the nature of subtitles. I'm now going to talk about the nature of subtitling, i.e. the process um, of uh, subtitling, of making subtitles. Uh, and subtitling as process is creative, because you, uh, because you have to come up with solutions to translation problems, and you have to do this creative condensation thing, and you have to rephrase and reformulate, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's also hermeneutic. You have to come up with your own meaning or find meaning in the source text and interpret that uh, in order to find solutions that will fit the, uh, the, the, uh, the subtitles uh, in, in their uh, small space and so on. So it's really creative, it's interpretive, and it's hermeneutic. And also, Interestingly, because of the constraints of subtitles, some of the meanings that are in, this, in the source text are highlighted and others are, are put into the background because you can't get everything into the subtitles. You have to prioritize. So some meanings get highlighted. And interestingly enough, it also brings new meanings. Uh, so even, even senses that aren't there in the, in, the, in the film can get added by the subtitles. Now, um, I know I've been talking a lot about theory now, so it's time for sex and drugs, I think. Uh, so let's return to train spotting, which is a good film for sex and drugs. Um, in, in this scene, we, I'm just going to show you still here and not, not the actual clip. Uh, this woman has just been given an injection of heroin by her boyfriend, because if you know train spotting, you know there are all heroin addicts in it. Uh, and she's really happy about this fix, and she's getting high, and she really enjoys it. And she says, that, that beats any meat injection, uh, which is a way of saying, obviously, that heroin is better than sex. Uh, but she says this in, in a rather creative way, because uh, you have an injection of heroin into her veins, but during sex you also have a different sort of injection. Uh, I'll leave that for your fantasies to work out. Uh, so this is rather poetic, really, uh, in a way. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a nice metaphor. Now, I've looked at two Swedish translations of this in subtitles, and the first one says this, this Lord I like note, which means this. I hope you can read it, because I'm not going to be nasty and read it to you. Uh, and the other one says something similar. Uh, so you can see that the subtitles have here interpreted what the woman says and gone for the for the bottom line here, that this is better than sex. But they have not recreated or they have not interpreted the, the surface meaning of, of what she's saying. There is no metaphor here at all. So they've disregarded that for the bottom, bottom line meaning. Now, obviously, you could, could say that there is no such word as meat injection in Swedish, and that's true, but there is no such word as meat injection in English either. This is creative language. Uh, and this is why you need people. So this is uh, two interpretations which are, I think, perhaps a bit lacking in imagination, but they're definitely interpretations of what she's saying. I'm going to show you a clip now which shows some more creative interpretation. Uh, and just to dull things down, we're going, now going to politi politicians. Uh, this is from the uh, uh, sitcom Yes, Prime Minister, uh, which is from the 80s, so you're all too young to remember, that, remember it. But anyway, this guy that we see here is the permanent sec secretary, Jim, uh, Sir Humphrey Appleby, and the guy with the back to us is the Prime Minister of Great Britain. And they're talking about schools and how it would be good to centralize them, uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, I beg you to pay attention to the metaphors used in this. Oh, no, I'm not supposed to do that. Sorry. I'm supposed to do this. <laughs> Prime Minister, then centralise. Take it away from the local councils. Put it under the Department of Education and Science. Then you could actually do something about it. Do you think I could? Grasp the nettle? Take the bull by the horns? Prime Minister, you can't take the bull by the horns if you're grasping the nettle. <laughs> Really, Bernard? <laughs> All I meant was, if you grasp the nettle with one hand, you could take the bull by one horn with the other hand, <laughs> but not both horns, because your hand isn't big enough. <laughs> and if you did take the bull by one horn, it would be rather dangerous, because... <laughs> ooh, ooh. <laughs> well, it, it was just a mixed metaphor. And <laughs> since we were discussing education, I... I uh, thank God. 
Okay, so that was a bit of fun. The Prime Minister was mixing his metaphors. He was talking about grasping nettles and, uh, and uh, taking bulls by the horns. And both of these metaphors, of course, mean to do something decisive and to do something brave and perhaps do something unpleasant, but, but take in charge of the situation. Now, I have the Swedish translation for you, but not a back translation, I'm afraid, because there wasn't room for it, but I'll walk you through it. Um, so we have two metaphors here. We have taking the bull by the horns, which is fine if you're translating into Swedish because that metaphor exists in Swedish as well. And I'm pretty certain that it's fairly universal, so you probably have it in, 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 in Slovak as well, or possibly. Anyway, grasping the nettle, however, is a very British metaphor. It doesn't even work in America. It means taking hold of a stinging plant. So, uh, so it's fairly transparent, but it's not a set phrase. It's not an idiom in Swedish. So people wouldn't necessarily know what he was talking about. So what this Swedish subtitle did there, it was uh, in the first subtitle title saying, kan jag spänna bågen, which means to draw the bow, which means something, uh, something similar. It means to do something brave and take action and, and do something. So it's, it's a set phrase in Swedish that you can do. But the thing is that take, uh, drawing the bow it looks very different if you want to illustrate it. And, and this chap Bernard, he illustrated the metaphors, didn't he, with, with the bull and the things. And drawing the bow actually looks like this. Something that you need both hands to, to do. And if, if he had put that in just as it was, it wouldn't match the images and then you have semiotic tension. So what he did a few uh, subtitles later is to say that if you draw the bow with one hand, then you, you can grasp the, the bull with, with the other hand. And, and if you think about it, if you want to draw a bow with one hand, you have actually have to stand on the bow and draw the string so that, and actually shoot yourself in the foot in the process. But, uh, but that sort of matches what Bernard is doing. Instead of grasping down to, gra uh, to grasp, uh, instead of reaching down to grasp the nettle, he's now reaching down to draw the bow, which means that he has come up, come up with a solution that matches the images. Now, the thing here is that we have now new meaning to the images that we see. We don't have, we don't have grasping nettles anymore, we have drawing bows. So the source texts the, the target text, which includes the source text, has now been changed. The meaning of the, source, uh, of the source text is changed in the target text to something different. So there's new meaning being brought here. So this is a very hermeneutic activity indeed. Okay, moving on to more technical stuff. Uh, master template files. Now, um, when you subtitle, you uh, also time code your subtitles, and that means to decide when they appear and when they disappear and how, for how long they should be on screen. And this takes some time. So what, uh, the com what companies started doing like 20 years ago was to introduce master template files. That means that someone did a translation and, uh, and also did the time coding, so to decide when they were to appear and disappear all the subtitles. Uh, and then that was used for subsequent translations. And then they didn't have to, to do all this technical stuff, they just did the translations. Uh, and that saved a lot of time. Uh, and no, nowadays, uh, master template files, files in the form of EMT, English master templates, are very, very common. Uh, Netflix uses them, everybody uses them, more or less. So that, uh, so that means that you, with, when you start subtitling, you already have all the dialogue written down uh, in a file already. Uh, and I'll show you how this process works and, uh, and how they used to work. I know this is very, very small, but in the first translation, that's like the old days. You had a source text, then you had a subtitler, and then you had a subtitle file. So that's very straightforward. But then when you added the EMTs, the master template files, you had someone making those files, and then you had uh, an EMT file, which also works as a secondary source text. And then the subtitle would translate the EMT file into your local language. And then you have a final subtitle file. So we have an intermediate step here, which is part source text and part target text in a way. Um, and the thing is, and I'll show you this, this later, that it's sort of fine when it's uh, the same language in the source text and in the template file, but if it's a translation, then that they affect the uh, subtitlers work a lot. And I'll, I'll show you, show you that, that in a minute. Uh, oh, and I've got some of these, yeah. Um, but if you add a machine translation to the thing, you have M, what they call MTPE <laughs> translations, uh, and that stands for, ma uh, for machine translation and post editing. So you have the EMT file, which is then fed into a machine. 
and the machine comes out with a, with a machine translation file, which is the first translation, a raw translation, if you will. And then you don't have a subtitler anymore. The subtitler is taken out of the equation and enter instead the post editor. And that is normally a subtitler as well, but it, it, he, he or she does no longer subtitle. They don't translate, they post edit, which means that they tidy up the mistakes that the machine has made and make the, uh, the text more readable, which is not as fun a task as subtitling, I can tell you. Now, in order for this to work, we need to up the reading speeds. We need to have higher reading speeds. And that is because you need higher, higher reading speeds for the machines to, uh, to process the text, because the text can't do this thing that I call creative condensation. The machines can't reformulate, they can't shorten the message, they can't interpret. So uh, we then have less, crea less creativity is called for, because you don't have to do this uh, reformulation thing, and you just go from source language to target language in a way. But this is problematic, high reading speeds is problematic, because if you run at 12 CPS, which means 12 characters per second of airtime, uh, which is what normally you have in most public service uh, companies, then 50% of the viewer's attention is on the screen, on what's going on in the action, and 50% of the time you're looking at the subtitles. So that your attention is equally split between subtitle and action. But if you up uh, the CPS, if you have higher reading speeds, then you spend less and less time watching what's going on on screen and more and more time reading subtitles. So if you're up to 17 CPS, which is what Netflix has, for instance, then more than 80% of your attention is going to be on the subtitles. And you're going to miss a lot of what, what's going on on screen. Or you're going to have to start skipping the subtitles in order to watch what's going on on screen. You can't do both anymore when the reading speed is that high. And also, it's rather tiring, because you have to be alert all the time to process all this. As I said, is that machines can't, can't condense. They, they can't do this creative condensation thing. So we have to have reading speeds that are uh, basically just spoken language speed. Um, and, and also, going back again to like 20 years ago, when they started using master template files before they were all in English, they tended to use a first-generation translation, uh, which uh, I'll sh I, know, I know this is not very current, but I'm going to show you it anyway because it shows the process of what happens when you go by an intermediate text. Uh, so I'm going to show you some stills and some audio clips from the movie Anaconda. I don't know whether you've seen it. It's not very good, so I don't recommend it. It's not actually train spotting or reservoir dogs or anything. Uh, it's about a bunch of people who are going on a scientific expedition in South America to find a lost tribe, which is very exciting. Along the way on the river, the leader of the expedition is bitten by a nasty bug and needs to be taken to hospital. So they, uh, they turn around and they go looking for, for a doctor. But then they stop to pick up a hitchhiker who stands in the middle of the river. And they pick this guy up because he's John Voight, so you have to. Uh, and he says, oh, so you're going to a hospital. That's very good of you. But let's catch a snake instead. Uh, and this is a rather odd suggestion. And in this scene, uh, we're di discussing whether they want to go catch a snake or get this guy to the hospital. Yo, hold your mind? It. Oh, sorry. Have I lost my mind? No, I haven't lost my mind. If anything, I'm completely lucid right now. I think it's you guys who need to open up your eyes. Yo, yo, hold up. How we go from taking Kale to the hospital to catching a goddamn snake? Do you know where you are? You're in the middle of the jungle. Okay, all you guys do is you question and you criticize. But just remember, you don't know shit about the shit we're in out here. And neither do I. Okay? Okay? But I guarantee you I know who does. This guy. Sorry about the poor stills, but the, the actual clip isn't available anymore. Anyway, this is the Swedish subtitles and the Danish subtitles of the th same thing. And I know you can't read Swedish or Danish, uh, but you can see that the subtitles are very similar, I think. Uh, so it's basically the same text in two different languages. I've, re uh, I've marked in yellow the things that are, in fact, different. And this thing that he said about you question is... Um, 
It's, it's turned into you ask questions in one of the languages. And don't you understand has become do you understand. Um, this guy over here has become this guy over there. So those are the only differences. And that means that the Swedish first translation has in fact been turned into a Dan Danish translation without any form of creativity at all. So it's basically just the same text in two languages. And if you're working with translation, you know if you give the same text to two different people, you're going to end up with two very different target texts. But that is not the case when you're using uh, template files like this. So, moving on to what's uh, important today. It's machine translation and post-editing. So, uh, I want to stress that post-editing is involved. It's when you have machine-translated subtitles, it's not just the machine putting the subtitles out there. There's always someone, or ideally there's always a human, post-editing them, checking them, making sure they're all right. Now, in, in the old days, we used to have something which was known as statistical machine translation, and that was not as good as the thing that we're using today, which is known as neural machine translation, but it was predictable, and it, it had more errors, but the errors were easier to spot, and they made more sense. And I put the word congeniality out there. I don't know whether you know the word congeniality. It's not very often used. It means basically being friendly and showing concern and interest for your friends and supporting them. So basically being nice is what congeniality means in, in the noun form. Now, if you translate that into Swedish, it would be something like trivsamhet or snällhet. But in fact, if you ran it through Google Translate, when Google Translate was still working on statistical machine translation, it turns out that it didn't mean in Swedish uh, snällhet at all. It meant secret agent, which is decidedly odd, isn't it? And not even secret agent in Swedish, but secret agent in English. And the reason for this, uh, and, and the fault of, of this is actually Sandra Bullock. Because in, in 2000, there was this movie called Miss Congeniality, where she is a secret agent, or an undercover cop, really, uh, who enters a, a beauty pageant in order to catch a killer, or a terrorist, I think. Uh, now, congeniality, as I said, is a weird word, and people wouldn't understand that in Swedish. So in Swedish, it's known as Miss Secret Agent. So that means that all over the internet, whenever anyone is talking about the movie Miss Congeniality in Swedish, they're talking about Miss Secret Agent. So the machine then thinks that congeniality means secret agent because that's the matches that it gets out there. And this is sort of, I think it's hilarious, but it's, it's, it, you can understand what's been going on here. You can see, you can trace it back and see that this is an error and this is how it appeared. However, these days, when you're working with neural machine translation, very few people understand what's going on because it's no longer just a question of matches. It's, it's a question of matches on morpheme level and it's also some weird algorithms going on. And I've talked to quite a few people and I went to quite a few seminars to learn how this works and I still don't really quite get it. And the teachers afterwards always admit that I don't quite get the hang of it either. So the thing is neural machine translation works much better than statistical ones because they produce better translations. But they also contain errors and the errors are much harder to spot when we come to neural machine translation because the translations look very nice. The target text that come out of neural machine translation look quite real but they may not match the original. There may still be translation errors in there but because they look nice people don't notice them. So that is really tricky. And uh, but since neural machine translation works so much better than the old version, uh, people have started using it. Uh, quite a few of the major uh, companies like Ayuno uh, have implemented this across the board. So now when you watch, particularly when you watch uh, daytime TV and so on, a lot, the chances are you're going to watch something that was produced by machines and tidied up by humans. Uh, <clears throat> and this is very interesting. I mean, this is a new kind of subtitles, but they look very much like the old ones, but they are, they are a new kind of subtitles. So we wanted to know what they were like. So uh, a master student of mine and, and myself looked into the human versus machine uh, dilemma. So what we did was that we took uh, machine translated and humanly posted its to subtitles, and then we took uh, human translated subtitles. They had used an EMT file, but that was in English, so they were turned into Swedish from an uh, English master template files, so the, the actual translation was made by humans in, in, in the uh, uh, 
and the tested material. Uh, so some uh, half of the material was made by machines, and half the half of it half of it was made by humans. I hope I make myself clear. So it shows 13 episodes. This is mainly a daytime TV because that's where you find it. 13 episodes uh, that were translated by humans and 13 that were made by machines. And that's a sizable corpus for our purposes, I think. Um, and what we wanted to find out was the, uh, the nature of machine subtitles, what they were like, uh, what features they had, and, uh, and so on. And we did that through a close reading and analysis. Uh, and then we did a quality, trans uh, co quality comparison because a lot of people say that uh, machine translation is worse than, uh, than human translation. Uh, but we don't know that if we don't check. I mean, that's a sort of gut feeling that everyone has. But if you're actually going to be a, a scholar, then you actually have to check. So that's what we did. And but for this, we, we used my FAR model, which investigates quality on three levels. It looks at equivalence, i.e. how good the translation is, and it looks at acceptability, which means how good the target text is, how good the Swedish language, is, language in the subtitles is, in this case. And it also checks for readability, which means uh, line lengths and, and um, exposure time and, uh, uh, and punctuation and very many things that have to do with the technical side of subtitles. Uh, and I won't drag you through um, the methodology more than that, and we can have that in questions later on if you want, and I'll go directly to the results because they are, after all, the most exciting part. Uh, and how oh, am I doing for time, by the way? Because I, I'm fine. Okay, good, good. I think that'll do. So, uh, from looking at this, or actually it was uh, Hannah Hoxham who looked, did most of the empirical work, or all of the empirical work, because I'm too lazy, uh, but she, uh, she found uh, these things, and she's very good at this because she used to be a QCA. She do, used to do quality control for a major firm, or she still does actually, so she, she has the hang of this. We found that they were fast paced, they were quicker uh, than normal sub when the subtitles are used to. Uh, you had many more short subtitles and with a higher reading speed uh, than you'd normally find with, uh, machine, uh, with human made subtitles. The more oral, which is very interesting, and I think that's the part of everything going into the machine and then everything coming out of the machine, which means that some of the oral features that we normally leave out, false starts and hesitations and that, were still there. They hadn't been spotted, they hadn't been taken away by the machine and they hadn't been spotted by the post editors. Not all of it, anyway. Uh, interestingly, they're also less coherent. You have many, uh, they have few co cohesive devices, few uh, conjunctions and other things that make sentences go together. The sentences are shorter and, shorter and they're also more incomplete sentences that lack subjects and so on. So they're le less good dramat uh, grammatically and, and text cohesively. And they're also incomplete, and by that I don't mean they're incomplete like incomplete sentences, but they lack bits. There are bits that have fallen out, bits that contain information that just isn't there. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of that later on, but th this is the weirdest thing, I think, that there are, sen there are utterances that are, are just not there. And I mean, when you do this creative condens condensing thing I was talk talking about earlier, then you do leave stuff out, which is not important, but here there are sort of random things being left out, which clearly people say and which is important for what's going on, but it's just not there. And the punctuation is... There's an extra eye there, that's interesting. Uh, 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 the, uh, the punctuation is inconsistent. And I know you could say, what, what about punctuation? Punctuation doesn't matter a lot. But in, in subtitling, the they, subpunctuation matters a lot because it tells you who is speaking and to whom and in what way. So italics, uh, speaker dashes, continuation dashes, loads of stuff with punctuation is important. And we also found that the segmentation the chunking of the text into different subtitles and also the line breaks were not syntactic. And why should this matter? Well, it matters because if you have unsyntactic segmentation, it's, the subtitles get harder, harder to read. So it's a more strenuous and more co cognitively taxing task for the viewers if the segmentation is not done in a syntactic way. Uh, so those are sort of the, the general findings. Uh, about the nature of subtitle, uh, machine translated subtitles. And uh, these are not very flattering, I would say. That these are mainly negative things. Now, looking at the quality, uh, uh, the quality assessment of uh, human versus, versus machine, that shouldn't be man versus machine, that's very sexist, sorry. It should be human. Anyway, 
uh, we looked at, we, we ran it through the, the file model, uh, or rather Hannah did, and uh, we, we came up with, with the results. These are the, the human-made subtitles, so, so these are the ones made by humans. And you can see there are errors, uh, and you're going to find errors, particularly if you're nitpicking like, like Hannah Hogstrom who did this, uh, is that you're going to find errors. But they're rather, they're not very many. Uh, the most re readability errors, which means that some uh, reading speeds might be a little bit too high and so on. So in these, uh, these 13, 13 human-made episodes, there are errors. But if we look at the, uh, the machine-made ones, there are many more errors. When it comes to functional equivalence, there are like 10 times as many errors. And the score, by the way, I should explain that, that this is, that all errors are not equally grave. Some uh, errors are worse than others. So, and, and then they get a higher point score, and, uh, and that affects the, the overall uh, error score. So there are 10 times as many uh, equivalence errors, and these are mainly due to stuff not being there, as, as I told you, important stuff being left out. And when it comes to acceptability, it's uh, almost 10 times as many there as well. So uh, it means that um, it, the Swedish isn't very good. It means that there is a lot of translation ease. There are a lot of English language structures that survive into the Swedish uh, subtitles. And above all, readability. Uh, and that's mainly due to, to, to poor segmentation and poor punctuation. So overall, um, I mean, there are, about the, there are about eight times as many uh, errors in uh, and the machine-made ones. So quality-wise, that there are—I'm not saying they're complete rubbish, but they're definitely worse than than human-made ones. Uh, and, and now we've actually checked it, so now we can actually say this, uh, which is, uh, I think, problematic. And this needs to be better because this, this is not good. Uh, this is, means it's going to be harder to to read subtitles in the future for the viewers. So if if we're not Going to, if, if it's going to stay like this, subtitles are going to be a lot less attractive for viewers. Now, we did a few other uh, observations. Uh, we noticed that the reading speed is high, which, which I have explained is, uh, is a must. You must have that if you have machine translation. And the errors that are in there, even if they're sneaky, because new, uh, neural machine translation errors are sneaky, they're still disruptive, which means that you don't get engrossed in the film as much as you would otherwise, because you find these errors which make you focus on the subtitles. And also, it means that um, there's less, less creativity for, for the uh, subtitles. To, to, uh, well, they're post-editors now, they're not subtitles anymore. And they're definitely getting dumber, because had they made the subtitles themselves, these are basically the same people who made the human-made ones, are now post-editing the other ones, uh, or similar people, anyway. They, I mean, they are, these are experienced subtitles. They wouldn't have let subtitles of this quality go through if they made them themselves. But now that the machine is making them, and they're only tidying up after the machine, they're letting all these things go through. So that, mean, that means that even this, the humans that are working for the machine, Oh, right, I've been talking too much. I'm wearing the microphones down. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just finishing. I'm, I'm just going to show you some examples of this, I think, which I think is the most worrying thing, that stuff is left out and the post-editors not noticing and not putting it back in. This is not part of the material that we used for the study, but it's very, uh, uh, it illustrates it beautifully. Uh, I'm not going to give you the background of this, because this is basically just daytime TV, but, but let's, let's listen to what they're saying. Did you notice how long the last subtitle lingered? It lingered on screen for 12 seconds, and normally that would just linger for like four seconds or something, because it's not that long. 
And I've, ha I've been marked in, in yellow the English parts that actually get translations, but all the last bit of it, the, 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 the brother John and the cousin Jack bit, is just not there. And if they're important to the story, I haven't watched the whole show, so I don't know, but if they're important to the story, it's important to introduce them. I mean, this is important, these are important factors. And we also see them on screen because they're right there in the photo, but they're not in the subtitles, so we don't know who are, we are looking at when we look at the photo. So this is important, uh, important stuff being in there. And, and uh, we normally, when we talk about, uh, when we compare source text dialogue and target text subtitles, you talk about a third being lost. If you go just with a word count, then you lose about a third. But here we lose only f almost 50%. And another example, which is even worse, is this. You saw that? I'm going to show, show you, walk you through it again. We have sort of normal subtitling, and this guy says something, and you have a subtitle for it. But then the subtitle lingers into the next scene, and we have some women talking that, and we don't know what they're saying at all. They're just being left out. And then the machine sort of perks up and says, we're going to talk, call her Victoria at the end. But all the rest of the conversation that these women have, which is presumably important, otherwise it wouldn't be there, is not part of it. And that means that more than half uh, less than half of what they're saying is actually put into the subtitles. So I think this, this is very problematic. Uh, so, uh, I'm winding up now. Uh, so why should we rehumanize subtitling? I mean, the, that's, that's what, I, what this conference is all about, rehumanizing translation, right? So I think there are some very good reasons for doing so, partic and particularly for, for viewers, for the consumers. Because you get higher quality subtitles when, when people are making them, which makes it easier to immerse yourself and get engrossed in the film that you're watching. Because subtitles are instrumental and you don't watch, want to watch the subtitles, you want to focus on the film. And it's also less strenuous. You don't have to read so fast and you don't have to get annoyed with various weird things that you find in the subtitles. So it's definitely better for the viewers, for the consumers. And for subtitlers, their job is then more creative if they do the subtitles themselves, if they do their own translation and come up with the more interesting translations. It's less monotonous, it's not just tidying up after the machine, and it's also more personal. I mean, some of the people's, people working as subtitlers here have, uh, oh, so, sorry, as post-editors here have been working as subtitles, subtitlers for many, year, and they, many years, and they have their own unique translation style. That goes right out the, out the window when they're post-editors, because then they're just tidying up after the machine. So I think the, the, the problem here isn't the machine per se. In the, the problem is that, the, that humans are working for the machine. They're given the machine output, and, and people say, tidy this, sort this out, instead of being in charge, in control of the machine. And that is, I think, the reason why they're, they're being sloppy, why they're leaving uh, this, the viewers with these poor uh, these poor quality subtitles. So how should we go about it? Well, there's been this manifesto published uh, these day, uh, very recently from the Audiovisual Translation uh, Union of Europe uh, that have looked into this because they're, they're clearly very concerned about th these changes to their prof profession. And my conclusions basically concur with what they're saying. Uh, we need to put the human in charge of the machine and not vice versa. That, the, these are my words, not theirs. But, but I think that's the root of the problem. We, we need to put the human being back in the driver's seat rather than having the machine controlling it. And that's where the, this notion of the augmented translator come, comes in, where the human being has control of all the machines that are working for it and being in charge. So I think that's the most important bit. And I, I'm not being a Luddite here. I'm not saying smash the machines. I'm, I'm, I'm saying by all means use the machines, but, but use the machines, don't let the machines use you. I think that's the most important bit. And also, when you have development like this, you need to involve the people who are actually going to work with it. You need to involve the subtitlers in the development of the new tools. We, we need to ask subtitles, what do you need and how can this help you in, to, to, do your to do your job instead of giving you another job to do? And I also think we need greater flexibility in thinking about what, uh, what we translate and how we translate it. Because there are some, uh, some genres of texts of TV programs that work 
I, I think, work rather well with machine translation, such as weather, report for, weather reports, which are very repetitive, where we, you have the same vocabulary coming back again. Uh, some soaps have been shown by Christopher Taylor to actually contain very much the same vocab as well. So machine translation would work very well there. Whereas, uh, for instance, comedies or dramas or feature films work, which have creative language use and which have grasping nettles and, uh, and taking bulls by the horns and catching snakes and stuff, that needs to be left to the humans to work with. And also, don't only say, now we got machine translation, let ma machines do anything. I mean, there are loads of different machines that do a very good job in helping the translator and leaving the um, uh, translator in charge, such as virtual, uh, various CAT tools, uh, automatic speech recognition, which helps you not having to type all the time, uh, translation memories, which suggests solutions to things that you translate a lot, leaving uh, time for the subtitles to work with the tricky bits, rather than having the machines work with the tricky bits as well. So uh, 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 a translation memory would come up with good solutions for standard phrases that you don't have to type in then, and, and then you can work with the part that needs create creativity. And above all, I think all people involved need to listen to each other's perspectives. I think that's very important as well. So uh, I know I've been talking for a very long time now, I think, so, so it's time for me to say a jacuyam, I think. Uh, and I'm, I'm, this is actually machine translated, so I don't know if it actually works, but, but uh, <laughs> uh, hopefully I, I want to say thank you anyway is what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Okay, no, it's fine. Thank you, Jan. Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the talk, and I'm sure uh, okay. uh, the, the audience did as well. And I have so many questions myself, but it would it would be rude to start with my questions. So uh, I would just like to remind uh, to uh, those of you who are watching us online that you can go to Slido and you can ask the questions in the application. Uh, all you need to put in uh, is our hashtag, uh, so hashtag TIC2021. And we already have some questions, and I do need strong glasses, stronger glasses. <laughs> Uh, I don't know uh, whether I should maybe read up the question for the rest of the audience. Uh, I would need it back, thank you. So, uh, don't you think that in the era of streaming services, it is no more useful to distinguish be between subtitling countries and the dubbing ones? Uh, very good question. It is a very good question, and, uh, and, it's, uh, and the, uh, the person asking it, which is Del Boy apparently from Only Fools and Horses, anyway, uh, it, uh, it, is, it is true that it's less useful now to talk about subtitling in Dublin countries. However, when you talk about uh, how entrenched the various modes are, it, it, it does still make sense to talk about uh, subtitling countries and dubbing uh, because you need to take into account the background of the viewers. So um, regardless, I mean, if you're watching HBO or, or Netflix, now you can choose between dubbing and, and subtitling. So it's down to the, to, the, to the viewer to choose rather than having a national policy, which used to be the case before. So it's down to the viewer, but the viewers tend to, to choose the mode that they're used to. So if you grow up with subtitles, you're going to watch subtitles. And if you grow up with dubbing, you're going to watch dubbing. So, so you condition the viewers f to, to choose a certain mode of AVT from what they're growing up. And I think it's going to be less and less clear what countries are dubbing countries and what countries are subtitling countries. And I mean, some countries are, are both. I mean, Poland uses voiceover for television, but subtitles for, for, for the cinema and so on. Uh, but, but still, uh, I, I think it was beautifully illustrated. Uh, I went on the radio talking about it only last week because Netflix have started dubbing uh, English language content in Swedish. And there was a public outcry because people thought it was absolutely ridiculous. We're not, we, they were actually offended that there was the, the dubbing option, uh, which, which is weird because, I mean, the, the dubbing option is good for people who don't, don't read, for instance, dyslexics and so on. So it's, it's actually an added value service. But people were offended that a dubbing was offered to Swedish people. Now, they did it in a, in a, in a very stupid way because one of the th things that they dubbed was the, the TV, TV series Hit and Run, which is half, where the dialogue is half in English and half in Hebrew, where the, the dubbing was only done for the English parts, where the Hebrew parts were still subtitled. And I dare say that Swedish people are better at English than they are at Hebrew. So that, that was very weird. But no, uh, in, in a sense, it still makes sense to talk about dubbing and subtitling countries, but uh, it will not be so in the future, I think. Uh, I think the second question we had from the audience is, is something which comes up uh, a lot in the debate and it's the question that also what, what, what your survey showed that, that if the result shows that it takes 
maybe more time, but the quality is worse, does it actually make sense to post edit if it would be maybe faster and more efficient to subtitle from the scratch? And I can imagine our friend uh, Amalie Foss saying this because uh, this is one of the points she's also making. And many, tr many translators and subtitlers are saying the same. So what do you think? Uh, well, I'd like to point out that this study did not look at the process at all. It only looked at the product. So we don't know for a fact that it takes longer to, sub to, to post edit. Uh, the companies say that it, in fact, saves a lot of time to post-edit. Uh, I know uh, subtitlers who say that it takes longer. I was involved in, in, in post-editing machine translation in the late 1990s, and when I tried it out, it certainly took longer, but, but machine translation has come a long way in the last 25 years. So, probably, it, well, I, I don't know. I don't know that this is the fact that it takes longer. Uh, so, so, without doing a study, I won't, I won't answer that question. Okay, uh, we have another question, and uh, I'll look here. We have uh, Daniel asking you uh, and saying, thanks for a great talk. Question, <laughs> how much power do we actually have? Uh, is there much hope of companies caring about manifestos, about rehumanizing re subtitling? Ah, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know. I think uh, we have more power if we're writing manifestos and if we're doing the studies than if we don't. Because if we, if we just uh, take it lying down, nothing's going to change. And then, the, uh, but I mean, this is this is a very commercial sphere of translation, and, and the money basically rules. So, so uh, the companies are going to do what they want to. And I, I'm, as I'm saying, I'm not a luddite. I don't say get rid of the machines. I'm saying that if we make the noise and we do the studies, then we may get the, the companies to listen and to use machine translation in a better way because we need better subtitles coming out of the machines and we need a better, better process. So, so I, I think we have to try and address the questions. Uh, but how much power do we have? Well, rather weak, I'd say, but we, we need to do this anyway. Well, when, when you talk about addressing uh, the question and the issues, um, that's where I would like to slip in one of my questions. Uh, because we have to address it also in training and in teaching. And I think that's a very important aspect we, we should talk about as well. Um, how do we train our audiovisual translators then? What do, they, what do we tell them? What do we tell them about some of the ethical issues which are coming up in relation to machine translation? What do we tell them about how much the profession is changing? I think this is becoming a bit of a burning issue and maybe we don't have that many answers yet. Uh, you're absolutely right. We need to address this in training, uh, because this is the reality that our students are facing. Uh, so we need to tell them about uh, EMTs and machine translation, and we need to tell them about the, about the tools and the dangers, and also the ethics. I didn't even go into that, but the eth ethics is a huge, huge issue. For instance, who owns the, uh, the, I mean, the subtitles going into the, uh, into the machine, uh, and that which the corpora that the machines are drawing from are actually made by subtitlers originally. And they don't get any credit for creating the, the masses of subtitles that the machine needs to do their translations. And then who owns the, uh, who owns the copyright of a translation made by the machine and post-edited by, post by a human? So uh, there are many ethical issues here and I, I think it's, it's very good to discuss them. Uh, having said that though, I still think that we should in a few ways, we should re retain our old ways of teaching. Because, I mean, you, you could arguably tell, ask the question, why do we need to teach our students how to, how to do time coding and, and segmentation if they're going to work with EMT files anyway? Well, I say, let's teach them the craft from the basics because then they have added value when they enter the market, because someone is making the EMT files as well. And if that is a subtitler who is aware of the needs of subtitlers, you're going to get a better EMT file. So, so let's teach the student the whole process, and then they can have a much easier way when they come out into it. But they need to know about the new things as well, of course. We have a very philosophical question, <laughs> uh, but a good one. Uh, is it even possible to rehumanize translation and translation studies and subtitling market in the era of capitalism, digitalization, and mass production? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. I, th I think it's, uh, it's worthwhile trying anyway, as I was saying. We, we, we do want to point out the flaws in the system and in, 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 in the machine, both literally and, and metaphorically. Uh, because because it, I think we need things to get better, and also 
if the quality keeps going downhill, then the viewers are going to, sooner or later, they're going to notice. Uh, and then that's where we get leverage for stuff like this. But we also need, uh, we need to try. I mean, we, we can't just not try doing this. So, so uh, and how, uh, how successful we're going to be, I think that's for, for the future to see. Um, yeah, uh, that's, we, we, we need to try, that's what I'm saying. There was also a very interesting point you mentioned in, in your presentation, and, and, and it is pointed out a little bit also in the manifesto by the Audiovisual Translators Europe. And you said, and, and we see it sometimes uh, also in subtitles, that okay, these were subtitles which were post-edited uh, by a person who most probably was a subtitler, but we see more and more often really that as you say, the things which we normally wouldn't do if we were subtitling, we accept as subtitlers sometimes. What do you think could be the other reasons behind it? Uh, because you mentioned creativity and definitely, of course, we don't have so many options as we would have, but can there be some also other issues causing this? Um, well, I, I'd like to, to point out that the, the people involved in our study, the post-editors were subtitlers. They were experienced subtitlers with many years of subtitling experience. Uh, and also, one thing that could be, one interpretation of the results of the study is that maybe subtitlers aren't the best post-editors, maybe that should be a different trade altogether, people working with just post-editing and not subtitling, because it's quite a diff different task. And to be honest, if I'm going to criticize our own st study here, uh, these people had not been working as post-editors for very long because it's fairly new. So, but maybe it's easier to, to train new people rather than to retrain subtitlers. I don't know, that didn't answer your question, by the way. I think, what, what was your question? <laughs> no, well, but it was a good point. But uh, yeah, I was asking about what could be the reasons behind a subtitler who is doing post-editing deciding that, okay, it's not perfect, but it can pass. Oh, it's fine. It's, right. it's maybe good enough. Ah. Uh, yes, uh, money. Of course, <laughs> I mean you don't get paid as much per minute as a post editor, as a and then as a subtitle. And, and uh, as people say, if you offer peanuts, you get monkeys. So uh, <laughs> and pe people are not going to get involved if they're not getting paid properly. So so that that matters. Actually, th these people involved in the study w were still uh, paid properly because they, they hadn't the the reduction in rate hadn't kicked in then yet, but it has now. So. Yeah, so you, you get paid less than the post editor, so you're going to w worry less about the results. And also, there is a results there which is s sort of works, right? It's it's good enough. It's it's not brilliant. And if you had done it, maybe it would have been brilliant. Maybe you have come up with something. But there is something there. Why would you bother changing it if nobody else is? So yeah. Uh, yeah, I would, I, I would absolutely agree with you and I, I think also our other colleagues and this actually helps us and leads me to joining the last two points uh, you made just, just, just now uh, because how should we train the subtitlers then or should we train them specifically for post-editing subtitling or just in post-editing because right now there's a practice in several countries, uh, in our region it's the same, uh, we train our students to be able to post edit, mm. but subtitling is very specific, uh, so probably this shouldn't be something that is happening separately. Yes, I think so, and, and that's what we're doing at Stockholm. We have a separate course in machine translation and post editing, not subtitling particularly, but, but it, it is a different craft, and I, and I think you need a different perspective to do it properly. Okay, uh, I will look at our questions from, from the viewers, from our audience. Uh, well, this is a good one. What made you working with subtitles? <laughs> because Jan was working also as subtitle for television for oh, many yes, years. Oh, yes, I was for, for many years, yes. Uh, well, I love television and I love language. <laughs> so, <laughs> as a youngster, I thought that, uh, I mean, being a subtitler combined these two things. And, and back in the day, it was very exciting, I think. It, even then it wasn't very well paid, but it was very exciting. And, and I worked for many years, and I could, say, I, I could brag about it. I could, could I see my name on television, and I, and I could say that I've been working with David Letterman for five years. David Letterman didn't know this, of course, because he was in New York and I was in Stockholm, but still I sort of felt an affiliation there. So, so the, the fame and the glory, basically, <laughs> was, were the things that drew me into it. Okay, uh, wonderful. Uh, we are running out of time, but I would have the very last question, mm -hmm. if it's fine. Um, because if I come back to the beginning of your, of your talk, you were talking about the polysemiotic structure and, and the const constructs we have in a film. And I think it leads all of us towards uh, 
contemplation whether actually machine translation can deal with this uh, because there are so many other layers and there are so many other meanings and, and machine translation still just works with the words we have in the sentences. So what do you think and, and what is the future? Do you think we will have some new tool which will help us deal with this as well and then Yes, I, I think so. There's going to be more machines, but there's still going to be even more need for humans to, 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 to work with the machines. Because I, I can see in the future that we have automatic speech recognition of dialogue and, and, and turning that into the EMT files. Uh, so right now there are humans uh, transcribing the dialogue, and I think that will be made by a machine in the very near future. And In fact, I think they're already working on that. Uh, however, you're quite right in that it takes a human mind to uh, to interpret the whole policy amniotic package. You need a human mind to interpret what the images are showing and also uh, inflection when people are talking and so on. So, so you're still going to need a human being to, to make the sentences work that go into the machine already. So that you need a machine you need a, a person helping the machine when it's fed the, the data and it also need, needs a human being to watch it after the machine comes out with it. Um, I had another point there, but I think it slipped my mind. Um, no, it's gone. Sorry. <laughs> I'll come back to that in, at the next conference, then, I think. <laughs> okay, hopefully here in Slovakia. <laughs> so that would be nice. But thank you very much, Jan. Uh, thank you very much for great talk and also for coming, joining us and, and sharing also the results of your work. And I would also like to thank the audience for their uh, questions and our two interpreters to make them more visible. Daniel Kruželák from Matej Bell University and Jana Ukušová, big Jan Pedersen fan uh, from Konstantin the Philosophy University. So thank you, everyone and we will continue as scheduled. Thank you, and thank you, Jan. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure.